But now on Radio 4, here's Victoria Corrin Mitchell with the programme that likes to commit heresy. Hello and welcome to Heresy, the show that challenges received wisdom and reprograms the sat-nav of lazy thinking. With me tonight to watch lazy thinking drive into a reservoir, believing it's a slip road onto the M25, are Reverend Richard Coles, Julia Hartley Brewer and Giles Corrin. <laughs> Later in the show, we'll be discussing the late Baroness Thatcher and what makes men sexy. But first... Let's talk about James Bond. Secret Agent Man, Secret Agent Man. They've given you one number and taken away your name. The genre having been reinvented by Daniel Craig, then Sam Mendes, and won BAFTAs and Oscars, 61% of our studio audience tonight believe. Skyfall is not just a Bond movie, it's a proper film. I've seen Skyfall and I had the full Bond experience. At the end, I was shaken and stirred. That was the usher trying to wake me up. (laughs) Now, those who haven't seen the film, be warned, we are going to discuss the unexpected twist that a completely run-of-the-mill film got lauded as a masterpiece. (laughs) Giles, did you think Skyfall was a masterpiece? No, it was a sort of a parody of a Bond film. It was incredibly silly. I mean, it got over that the main problem it has is that Bond is such an obvious tosser. It's the problem that they start... (laughs) Every film begins with, what are we going to do with this man who knows an awful lot about wine and is going to tell you about it? Has catchphrases like Bruce Forsyth. uh, And is going to force his attentions on women who don't really want it and then kill people that you quite like. And check out uh, the the Javier Bardem, the the baddie, is a ludicrous... The the fact that he's very camp and gay seems to be an explanation of his psychosis. Like the the wine waiters in Diamonds Are Forever in 1973. You could still... 40 years on, he's gay, he, he's got to be him, it's the baddie. Um, and, then, and then, although they ease off on the wine thing, where, which the wine, the wine knowledge of Bond is always just like being a train spotter. Knowing a lot about anything means you've nerded it up in a library. When he goes, oh, 53 Don Perignon, that's the same thing as saying, I think you'll find the 845 out of Doncaster is a diesel. <laughs> 734-827 on a, you know, broad gauge. Well, Daniel Craig does this. He does this thing where he meets this beautiful girl. He spots a tattoo on her, on her wrist and his arse. He'd, he'd been uh, sex trafficked as a child by the Malaysian Ngong Wong gang. Uh, <laughs> actually boasting that he's noticed that she was trafficked as a child and, and bullied into the... And then, and, then that, and, then, and then about ten minutes later, he just forces his way into her shower and shags her. Uh, without her really even wanting him to. Uh, she's punished for that by, by being killed, as, as you will. Whereas, whereas uh, the girl who manages to resist his, his, his advances is rewarded with becoming a Secretary. Uh, <laughs> uh, at the end, I mean, uh, Money Penny, and and then M, who is you know, Judy Dench has spent you know eight films finally carving a, a, a decent role for a for a woman in a Bond film, is killed and replaced with Rafe Fiennes. Uh, she's killed when, despite having been a spy for forty years, she tries to escape in the dark from the baddie across a moor, but takes a lantern with her. <laughs> So that when he comes out, when he comes out with his machine gun, he can see her hobbling away. Is it this way? And she's, she's, you know, she's the head of the secret service. Very poor. Julia. <laughs> Julia, did you think Skyfall was a great movie? Well, I had such high hopes for Skyfall. It's the only film I actually went to see at the cinema in the last year. Um, as a general rule, I don't think sitting in silence in a darkened room listening to other people eat is a, a great night out. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I just, I found it incredibly, incredibly depressing. I thought it was supposed to be so original, it was supposed to be so different, but it was so formulaic. It was bond by numbers. It was basically an advert for expensive cars and watches rather than a film. I mean, and, and things like, oh, James Bond doesn't drink martinis, shaken, not stirred anymore. Oh, how clever, he drinks Heineken. I imagine that was postmodern. If I knew what postmodern meant, I imagine that's what it was. I can only guess there was no vodka left to make the martinis because Adele had drunk them all. And the <laughs> I mean, she 
must have been drunk for that. But I, I did, Let I me stop in and say we're quite sure that the very professional singer Adele was, was not, not drunk for that <laughs> performance. You're listening to Radio 4. <laughs> but it's a, it's a sad day when the best actors in the film are the Komodo dragons. One of the sponsors was Macallan. And, the, and in the moment when, when the beautiful girl gets a glass of whiskey put in her head like hilarious William Tell riff, and then Bond could save her but doesn't, so she gets shot, killed, the glass falls off, and Daniel Craig, the modern new sexy Bond, says, uh, waste of good whiskey. They paid to be, to be the joke about a woman being shot. That was McAllen. I mean, yeah, but you're still talking about them. You're, you're playing into them. Every the time I kill a woman, I drink a McAllen. But what a noise. <laughs> Richard Coles, what Hello. did you make of Skyfall? Are you a Bond fan? Did you think it was a great classic work of art? I think good proper movies are grown up, really. Not all of them, but they should be really grown up. And this is not a grown up movie at all. It's infantile and adolescent, just up a notch or two. It's a kind of like an adolescent just turning a bit goth at the end. <laughs> um, you know, he's a man, he kind of jumps around, he has handbag fights with baddies on the top of trains. Um, he kind of drives his car through brick walls and everything. He sets his own hair on fire. And then five seconds later, without even so much as blinking, uh, he emerges kind of unflurried and untouched by these adventures. I went to... I was in Los Angeles uh, for the Casino Royale. I went to the premiere of Casino Royale because I knew somebody there uh, who worked on the film, and he told me that it works... that it breaks even on men and makes money on women, which is why Daniel Craig has to take his shirt off and fall in a pond, because <laughs> that's the profit. The profit is... You're thinking of Mr Darcy, aren't you? Yes, no, no, but it's the thing. It's absolutely the thing. You have to see his glistening nipples. I mean, you're making it sound like... <laughs> sorry, sorry can, can, I, can I just take a moment now? OK, <laughs> carry on. <laughs> <laughs> They've tried to make him a serious character. You know, he's driven by demons, he's violent, he's meaningless sexual encounters. I mean, Reverend, how would you minister to him? <laughs> With great enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I tell you, I have, at my last parish, Pierce Brosnan used to come, so I have ministered to Bond. But Daniel Craig, Julia, I mean, I think he's a great actor. Genuinely, I think he's a great actor in serious stuff. My problem with him as Bond is there's no twinkle. Is there? We don't want someone that serious in the role. No, there always has to be the twinkle. I, I was always a Pierce Brosnan fan on that front. I thought, we thought he really got he's the twinkle. He's just a twinkle. He is just a twinkle. <laughs> <laughs> the, thing, the thing about... <laughs> there is that. It's that the Daniel Craig... I don't, Daniel Craig, to me, looks like Ross Kemp in a wig. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, which is, and I'm not saying Ross is not a sexy man, but it's just... It's, as an international man of mystery, it, it's not really. I that Daniel Craig will be in EastEnders by the time he's 50. Well, I, think, I, think, I, think, I think there's all sorts of cleverness in the film. Sam Mendes, I think, is a brilliant director, and I think it's Roger Deakin who shot it. I mean, there's a lot of brilliant, brilliant people working on it, but it is essentially Top Gear with fire, isn't it? <laughs> Thinner people burning things down. <laughs> That's what it is. Why don't we go to the audience and find somebody who thinks that Skyfall is a great film... Georgie Darley, did you enjoy the, uh, the Bond film, Skyfall? Yes, I did, yeah. I suppose it wasn't as clichéd as the other Bond films, really. But don't you think that it tried to get serious with this moody Bond and the he's a miserable character? It's also it's 143 minutes long. It's 20 minutes longer than The Spy Who Loved Me, and that has a car that goes underwater. <laughs> In that respect, I think it was a, a, an amazing action film, full stop, sort of. It, it provided what people expected from it, almost, but with a little bit more. Was it glistening nipples? <laughs> <laughs> Not specifically, no. <laughs> if you didn't close your eyes with it glistening nipples. <laughs> I've just got this image in my head of a Bond film that's not an action film, a sort of Downton Abbey period <laughs> drama. <laughs> Bond well, film. I mean, you said that the first Bond on movie was David Niven, I think, wasn't it? David Niven, who was a very unswashbuckling sort of fellow. The thing I like about Daniel Craig is kind of borderline camp. There is something very camp about James Bond, although it's kind of, you know, a very obscure sort of camp. Camp and yet homophobic, that's the camp, unique thing about the franchise. But there's it? a bit where he does this sort of pouty thing. You know, he does this kind of cool, steel-blue eyes looking at murder at you, and then all of a sudden he sort of goes... <laughs> what he was doing. <laughs> Richard, can you describe for our listeners precisely what that face is? <laughs> if I told them, I'd have to kill them. <laughs> I think that's enough on Skyfall. I hope we've thrown cold water on the idea that this overlong romp was the new Citizen Kane. I thought Skyfall was such an artistic failure and the protagonist so unengaging, I swear, if I saw Daniel Craig in the street, I would march straight up to him, jab my finger in his face and say, Oh, Daniel, your arms are much bigger in real life. <laughs> 
Let's move on to the subject of Lady Thatcher's funeral. A grave day for the nation. Some wept, others paid their respects at St Paul's Cathedral. Many mourned the passing of a great leader. While for others... Yes, we're talking about the death of Baroness Thatcher, who spent her last years in a famous London hotel where she was sadly suffering from dementia. The staff knew her simply as Ritz Crackers. <laughs> now, now, that was in bad taste. And 70% of our audience believe the Thatcher death parties were in bad taste. These were the parties that were thrown around the funeral and around the news of Lady Thatcher's death. But Richard, Mrs Thatcher thrived on controversy. I think she'd have quite liked the parties, don't you? Well, you know, I think, there are, I think they were bad taste, but I think there are worse things than bad taste. And worse than bad taste, and I'm sure Mrs Thatcher would have thought the same, is to live in fantasy. And I thought at least what you got with the Thatcher parties was you saw someone living in a world which you found vaguely recognisable, which I didn't find at all with the funeral itself and with the kind of great solemnities to which everybody rose. This idea that somehow th around Thatcher's death we would all meet and mourn solemnly the passing of a leader who somehow stood for something to which we can all subscribe and all wipe a tear as we say farewell to it. That was a wicked, wicked, wicked lie. And it completely, completely disenfranchised the people of England who had been busy, busy disenfranchising in her political career too. It was a fantasy, and I thought that was objectionable. And it's also... Yeah. <laughs> it's a fantasy, and also it's a funeral. And a funeral is where someone goes to meet their maker. It's a very simple sort of thing. And to turn it cynically into some great big uh, political exercise is cynical and wrong. And I'll get my coat. <laughs> <laughs> Julia, I know you felt that Lady Thatcher's death should be treated with respect, but wouldn't you think that a great sign of political engagement, disagreement with her, any kind of major statement, sort of is respectful, showing strength of feeling that she was a significant person? Well, in, in, sense, in the very real sense of the phrase, it's what she would have wanted. Um, uh, frankly, anything that reduces George Osborne to tears it can't be all bad. <laughs> but, you know, if you think about it, burning effigies is a long-standing tradition in Britain. Uh, Lady Thatcher was a Conservative, she likes tradition. Um, I, I, things have been pretty hard in Britain recently. I mean, we, we've had, you know, the economy is absolutely buggered. We've, um, we haven't had a summer in three years. Um, I think we have to take our opportunities when we can. Any excuse for a street party. Um, and I do, think, I do think for her, though, for Lady Thatcher, she was an old lady when she died. And I think 23 years after leaving power, I think she'd have been pretty chuffed that people were still talking about her, even if they weren't saying nice things. And, and anyway, I would always rather, as a matter of principle, prefer to see people hijacking a funeral rather than a wedding. And, by the way, that includes you, Pippa Middleton. <laughs> <laughs> Giles, what I, do you think of the, I the think death I'm parties? I'm not quite addressing the, the thing, which is the tricky thing about the question, which is that the, the, the Thatcher death parties were in poor taste. I think, I think they were nice. I thought the death parties were sweet. I think <laughs> those nice little old lefties in their rat-bag donkey jackets coming out and eating pot noodles and pretending it was the miners' strike again. <laughs> This lot just wanted to get together, hands round a brazier, fingerless gloves and stuff, talk a bit about Karl Marx, although they've never read him, uh, and then be, be mean to an old lady. I think if Thatcher had been a, the sort of Prime Minister who set out just to be liked, it would be sad. If she were like Barack Obama or David Cameron, who has no interest in policy, no principles or ideologies, they just want to be popular, so they do whatever their advisers tell them most people would probably like, and then they were booed when they died, that would be really, really sad. Also, the other, the saddest thing you could ever say about a funeral isn't it? Particularly with The Great Gatsby and the film being out and everyone. The, the, the sad thing about a film is when nobody goes. The great bathos at the end of Gatsby's dazzling but hateful life uh, is that no one goes to the funeral. I fear that when I'm buried, I'm, it's just going to be a rainy, multi-denominational uh, dump up on the North Circuit. No one's going to come. My sister will be busy recording some glamorous radio show. <laughs> they'll, they'll shovel me into the ground and nobody will be there. If a thousand people came out eating pot noodles shouting, Jiley, 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 out, 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 <laughs> I, I, I would consider that a send-off. 
about the leaders now that just want everyone to like them, but actually what that's bred is a nation of people that are just politically apathetic, unengaged, easily distracted by meaningless trivia. I read yeah. a great article about this in... Um, <laughs> or now... <laughs> I choose to believe that people were not cheering in some horrible way about an old lady. They were trying to show disagreement with her political approach. And that's and that... right. And I do think there's this sense that... I mean, what, what concerned me about the funeral and everything, and the way it was sort of played out in the media, was that somehow it was a kind of national moment that we were all signed up to, and I think we weren't at all. And if you go north of Watford, if you go to the northeast of England, if you go to Scotland, where I was recently, the idea that somehow that represented something around which people could cohere is just completely nonsensical. And, you know, that's nothing to say about the personal qualities of the person. I think she was a fascinating person, hugely important person, but they got that wrong. It wasn't about her, it was about a sort of cynical political manipulation. And it was very Skyfall. That whole thing of Skyfall of, you know, the Union Where Jack the coming out. But, but they were not, she was the Komodo dragon. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but, sorry, maybe the, the but there was this thing about the Thatcher funeral which, which sort of bothered me. Again. Like in Skyfall, there's this sense about being in love with your own death. And it's another aspect of fantasy. Skyfall, we lower the Union Jack, we look back on our imperial past, we wipe a tear from our eye, and we kind of get off on that. And I thought it was the same thing with Thatcher. The funeral itself was attended by celebrities, dignitaries and Neil Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that at the funeral, Fergie, the Duchess of York, was at one point playing with her phone, you know, sending messages on her phone. Would you not say, Giles, that's more disrespectful than protesting? Oh, it's probably quite boring, though, wasn't it? It was a funeral. <laughs> it was, uh, she was only, she's only texting some billionaire saying, you know... I'll I'll have my shoes off by six o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit like the Olympics, isn't it? It's actually much better watched at home. I think we should go to the audience, find out why they thought these protests were tasteless. Amy Wilkerson. Hello. You felt that the, uh, the Thatcher death parties were in poor taste. I sure did. What was your main objection? Call me idealistic, but I'd like to have a political situation where we could have genuine debate. And instead we had people genuinely mourning a dead old lady and people going out in the streets to celebrate her death. And that's never going to be a situation where the two people can talk to each other and discuss the issues. But don't you think that genuine debate has to start with difference of opinion? Obviously, no point debating with Mrs Thatcher now. You know, she's not here. But there wasn't much point debating with her then. <laughs> <laughs> On a happier note, my dad almost once ran over Michael Foote. That could have changed the course of history. <laughs> I mean, it couldn't have changed the course of history that much. Well, yes, because, because if he hadn't been leader, for, uh, it's possible that Labour could have got in earlier and then Thatcher tried, wouldn't have been... You, when he almost ran over, he ran him over. He tried to and missed. Michael Foote was too quick. <laughs> <laughs> Where is Cher Hodgkins? You think the death parties were in poor taste. Why? Yeah, very poor taste. I think there's plenty of excuses for to party. Finding your £20 note, drinking, uh, feeling a bit frisky. But I have to say... Hold uh, on, hold on. <laughs> Wait a minute, it only costs 20 quid to get Cher feeling frisky, is it? <laughs> Less for you, Joss. <laughs> um, <but laughs> And when you're feeling a bit frisky, you throw a party. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you honestly think that what happened was in bad taste? Or was it that you saw the press getting wound up? This is terrible, there are going to be parties. On the day, they did just sort of turn their back showed a bit of feeling about it. Is that not appropriate? I have to say, I didn't actually follow it on the day because so much got spun around it and it was so much, I just got bored. But there was a time to debate that and it, I don't think the time is when somebody has passed away. What positive effect has uh, occurred from after that now? I don't know. They've got a bit of practice in for Guy Fawkes night. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it did the biggest row I ever had with the curate was over the death of Margaret Thatcher. It was exactly that point. I remember seeing communities of miners in South Wales being absolutely destroyed by her policies. The curate grew up 15 years younger than me uh, with a completely different experience of her, thinking that she was sort of part of the national furniture in the way that the Queen was part of the national furniture or his gran was part of the national furniture. And when she died, it was like this moment of complete mutual incomprehension. I couldn't understand why he felt sad. He couldn't understand why I found it so difficult to feel sad. And it was a generational thing. What a happy image of life if they find and perish. <laughs> Tell me you were drinking a cup of tea and having a scone as you had this row. <laughs> I think it was in Lent. We wouldn't have had a scone. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I don't think I've ever had a disagreement with a curate. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to. You haven't lived, Charles. <laughs> Should be on those lists of things to do before you're 30. It's all sort of bungee jumping, isn't it, and having a threesome. Have a row with a Thank curate. 
Let's bring that topic to a close and conclude by saying perhaps the Thatcher death parties were in appropriate taste, a tribute to the political engagement that Mrs Thatcher triggered while she was in power compared to today's apathetic times. But there are things in common between Mrs Thatcher and the politicians of today. Mrs Thatcher was politically astute, like David Cameron, troubled with divisions in society, like David Cameron, and will go down in history as a great leader. <laughs> We're moving on to a cheerier subject now, starting from the premise that women love to laugh. What a funny situation, startling revelation. What a funny situation. Women love to laugh to the point where 88% of our audience believe it's sexy for men to be funny. Yes, the good old sense of humour. But the truth is, it has actually been found that laughter and erotic stimulation affect totally different parts of the brain in what scientists have described as their favourite day in the laboratory ever. <laughs> We continue to believe that for men, being funny is an important part of being sexy. Julia, how much do you fancy Ken Dodd? <laughs> well, I think that's it, isn't it? I, of course, I think we can all recall, you know, being teenagers and, and, and having those posters on our wall. I mean, I love John Taylor. He's the wittiest guy in Duran Duran. I mean, that just wasn't how I thought about things. I mean, I've never been turned on by a knock-knock joke in my life. It is an absolute nonsense. It's one of the biggest travesties in life, this idea that women want men to be funny. We want you to be gorgeous and we want you to be rich. <laughs> and frankly, we're not even that bothered about the gorgeous bit. <laughs> Women are very practical and no laughter has ever paid a bill or a mortgage. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> The truth is, the truth is that, that men only learn to be funny if they can't use their good looks to get girls into bed. Giles, you're quite funny on your day, although the idea of you being sexy makes me want to leave the stage briefly and vomit. <laughs> yeah, I worried about talking about this in front of my sister. I thought, yes, it's because at this stage I would normally try and say something funny to the female presenter in the hope that she would pretend she didn't fancy me, but did. And, <laughs> not only that, actually, funny, my, my sister doesn't even think I'm funny. About five years ago, five years ago, I, I, I went into psychoanalysis uh, and I, five times a week and I was a bit worried as this woman unpicked my personality. I was talking to Tori, who's my, my closest confidant, or was before I got married, uh, and I was saying, I'm really worried she's going to pick my personality to pieces and, you know, I won't be funny anymore. And Tori thought about it and said, you're not that funny now. <laughs> uh, so, I, got, I mean, I have said it before and I will say it again. If women fancy funny men, Woody Allen wouldn't have to have married his own daughter. I, I was a hilarious teenage virgin, uh, but couldn't get a shag for enough more money. I was a hilarious teenage virgin too, and it wasn't until I started walking around in a cassock and a dog collar that I started getting the eye. <laughs> it's true, there's this phenomenon called cassock chasers, and it's... <laughs> Seriously. Seriously, you can sit there, you can sort of spout jokes in the pulpit all day long and not a stir in the congregation, but turn up in a 39 butter whipple soutane and all of a sudden, it's true, there's a thing, cassock it's a thing. Part of your remit, of course, your ministerial remit is to counsel couples and look at, you know, marriages and people falling in love and so on. Yeah. Do you, have you observed it is sexy for men to be funny? Do they do better? I, what I've observed is that it's funny when men think they're being sexy, which is not quite <laughs> the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> and the point about, I think, Julia, your point was right. I think what gets people together is not uh, the repertoire of uh, smart remarks, actually. It's kind of a powerful attraction thing. It's glistening nipples. It's cast. <laughs> Can we stop saying glistening I'm nipples? I'm sorry. <laughs> it's glistening nipples revealed as you tear off your 39 button cast. No, that's another. <laughs> that's a whole new departure for the Bond franchise and the Reverend James Bond. <laughs> Double O heaven. <laughs> <laughs> My, mine's a glass of cheap red wine, not shaken, yes. not stirred. Yes. <laughs> but on 
dating websites, every man listed will say good sense of humour. Why is that, Julia? Why do they think that's what people want to read? Because women pretend that's what they want. What they mean is they want a guy who's going to vaguely listen and pretend, well, pretend he's listening to what they've got to say. By the time you've descended to a dating website, all self-respect is blown. You're right. <laughs> right, anything. Just write some random acronym in the hope that somebody will give you a call. Says the 20-year-old virgin. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should go to the audience, find out what they think is so sexy about funny men. Let's bring the lights up. Emily Beach, you think it's sexy for men to be funny. Explain to me what it is you like. There's definitely a line. There's sarcasm and wit, that's fine. And then there's puns, and that's not OK. <laughs> or sexy. <laughs> what if, when your bra comes off, they make a funny noise? <laughs> What noise? What noise? What noise? What noise? Well, when you say they well, make a funny noise, <laughs> <laughs> although the reverend's looking quite intrigued. Giles, we need to talk. <laughs> How many buttons was it again? Thirty-nine. <laughs> now, Rod Broomfield, you think it's not sexy for a man to be funny? Why not? Well, I've been told on quite a few occasions I'm quite witty, and uh, sex life doesn't speak for that. <laughs> What do you think you should be brushing up on socially to be more attractive? Uh, facial surgery? <laughs> OK, now, listen. OK, women, or, or men, I don't like to presume, people. We've got men who are articulate, who are intelligent, who are great-looking, and they think they need to be better-looking and richer to find dates. This is terrible. Wait a minute, I'm supposed to be arguing against the received opinion. Ignore me. Yeah, unlucky. <laughs> Victoria. What first attracted you to the hilarious David Mitchell? Oh. <laughs> you may very well ask, but I... I no, don't do it. It's... Don't go there. <laughs> he's, I, he's, look, I'm very shy talking about it. I'm going all pink. I... I don't fancy David for being funny. I am a very boring, one-dimensional person and I just find him physically attractive. Because he's funny, I thought he might be a nice person to marry, you know, long-term. He'd be quite interesting. <laughs> On our honeymoon, we weren't sort of Having flicking jokes. off the lights and yeah. going, you know, tell me the one about the three shepherds going to a pub. <laughs> only count for so long uh, into a relationship. I'm ten years into a relationship with my husband and, uh, yeah, the swinging from the chandeliers is all very well, but it, there's, a, there's rather more farting on the sofa, I find. It. <laughs> and, 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 and it's good if you have a sense of humour about that. <laughs> I don't know, anybody can laugh at a fart, though, surely. You're so posh. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's the end of the show, so let's wind things up with my secret admission. Speaking as a woman, it's absolutely true, there is nothing sexier than a man being funny. And you know what I find funny? Broad shoulders, good hair and a Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much to my wonderful guests, Giles Corrin, Richard Coles and Julia Hartley Brewer. Good night. Heresy is written, presented and produced by Victoria Corrin Mitchell and co-produced by Daisy Knight with additional material by Charlie Skelton and Rob Colley. The series was created by David Baddiel and is an Avalon production for BBC Radio 4.